Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Aitchison, and this is number 100. What do you do for your 100? Well, you invite on somebody that is very, very special, and I'm absolutely delighted that today's guest said yes. Uh, I've pestered him a wee bit. Uh, I backed him into a corner. Didn't really give him a huge amount of opportunity to back out. Uh, so he's dialed in from far, far away, and I am so pleased because this is a man that I think is known by everybody and that's because of the good things that he's done and the way that he's carried himself and gone about his business he's everybody's favorite uh, i'm not going to waste any time because he's a busy boy so let's bring in the one and the only mr greg laidlaw hello sir hi bruce thank you very much for your, your very kind introduction and uh, yeah great to, great to hear a familiar voice from back home uh, great to see your see your face sitting there as well <laughs> <laughs> you liar! So, <laughs> you, Japan, you're in a you're in a hotel room on a camp with your with your team. What happens on a Japanese preparation camp? Um, yeah, so we're, we're about uh, I guess one hour outside of, of Tokyo and uh, a little place called I think it's called Ichihara. Um, so we're what's happening at Japanese camp? We're we're approaching our games, actually, first games. We actually play against uh, Western Force in just over a week's time. They're coming over from Australia, and that'll be our, our first game. So we're, we're pretty much, we've been working pretty hard. There's been a, a whole heap of running going on. Uh, no too many weights, as is the way these days. Um, it's kind of one, two, six. That's the kind of weights I do these days uh, to, to get to six reps. Um, so, yeah, we're dialing in a bit more uh, the rugby stuff uh, and preparing for our, for our first warm-up games before we start the league. You still love it, eh? I still love it. I certainly love the game. Um, yeah, I don't know when you get older and into my age, you know, you, you probably you certainly don't enjoy the gym as much, uh, or I certainly don't. But um, you know, you get in there and have a laugh with the boys, and you know, do as much as you can, and, and just get yourself ready to play. So, uh, yeah, this camp will uh, get us ready to play again. Japan come at the right time in your career to give you a new challenge. It, yeah, it did. Um, I was really close to, to staying in France uh, because I just, obviously at the time um, when I was with Clermont and finishing up, it, it ended in the middle of COVID and we were sort of midway through the season. So I was a little bit disappointed on that. I had a, a good option to stay in France and play for a different club. Um, and I was getting to that point, I was starting to speak a little bit French and stuff. But yeah, it was just, you know, when you... I had to try and think ahead and, you know, the day that I was going to retire is, you know, would I have regretted not taking this opportunity and, and I probably think I would have. So, yeah, it's been an incredible experience uh, so far and, and it still is. Uh, so, yeah, we're having lots of fun and I'm certainly glad I've done it. So how does it come about? Do, do you put feelers out, the clubs approach you or agent or the players chat amongst themselves and say, this guy's keen? Yeah, well, I was pretty fortunate in, in terms of you know, I had a few uh, a few Japanese clubs interested as early as, as, as 2019 uh, during the World Cup. Obviously, that was, that was out here in Japan and things, you know, just sort of snowballed from, from there. You know, um, an agent came in to, to meet me uh, with my Scottish agent uh, out here in, in Tokyo when I was out here with Scotland and just said, look, there's already interest. Uh, you know, would you, it was just an initial conversation. Obviously, I was still in contract. Um, in France, you know, would you potentially be interested when you when you're out of contract? And you know, that I think it's you're, you're silly to certainly not have a look at these things. And and obviously, yeah, I had a I had a look in there a little bit more. And uh, yeah, so here I find myself uh, today, which is you know pretty cool, really. There's no way looking back at Greg that was playing for Jed could possibly have predicted half the stuff that you've done. I mean, there's there's no way you, you would have thought you were going to play professional rugby in Japan. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, it's uh, it's really strange, uh, Bruce. It, it's it's one thing I, I think about, you know, a fair bit. I, you know, I was obviously just a young lad growing up and down there in Jed, you know, a town of 4,000 4, people. And, you know, who, who, well, I certainly would never have thought in a million years, I'd, you know, I'd end up in, in somewhere like Tokyo uh, playing my rugby near, you know, near the end of my career. And, you know, we went into Tokyo the other day and, you know, the Shibuya crossing. I've got my mother-in-law here at the minute. So, you know, showing our, some of the sights and sounds of Japan. So it's uh, it's an amazing place. And, you know, I've, had a, I've been able to live, I guess, an amazing life 
in many ways through through a game that I've, you know, I've grown to love over the years. And Greg that played at Jed, I've, I've spoken to a few uh, exiles for Jed. Tanner's been on, spoke to Clark, uh, spoke to Chris Laidlaw, your, your cousin. And there's a whole load of good things going on for folk for Jed. You've, you've gone out in the world and made it a better place and taken the opportunities. Do you, do you sit back sometimes and just go, I've done all right here? Uh, sometimes you, you, I certainly sit back, and whether I've done all right or not, you, uh, you know, I certainly sit back. And you know, when I left school, I went uh, straight into the joiner shop. Really, I, you know, I was I trained to be a joiner. And sometimes my my wife and I have a, a little laugh and and think, you know, it was, it was simple, certainly simpler times when we're, you know I was just a joiner and, and she was a nurse, and uh, you know we we're sitting trying to work out some something. It was something to do with tax or something in the Japanese tax system the other day. And, you know, we're just thinking, you know, sometimes when did life get so complicated? But but there we go. It's it's all part of the fun and uh, you know, part of the, the adventure we're on uh, over here. And because of COVID, there's not really been the chance to travel as freely. Um you have been back and w- what was that like coming back? Did you did you have a wee wobble? Did it feel like, oh hang on a minute, this is where I should be? Uh it is amazing when you come home, you know, and you and you you know, whether it's you go and see your parents or you, you know, you get back up in Edinburgh or, you know, or something. You, there's always something there, and and Scotland will definitely be home uh, for, for me one day. But you, you just gotta, you know, push yourself outside your comfort zones, and in, in many ways. And again, it's no, well, it's easy, isn't it? I could have just said, I ah, will just, you know, we'll just not bother coming back. We'll, we could just stay at home, and it, and it would be easy. But you know, full credit also to my to my wife. Uh, she's been incredible. Uh, through the whole thing, we've just had a third child. Uh, who was born uh, here in Japan. Uh, she had to do it all on her own, essentially, because I, I actually wasn't allowed into the birth because of there's still COVID restrictions uh, around the hospitals and stuff here in Japan. So, yeah, sometimes it's, it would be easier to stay at home, but yeah, but we're having a great adventure, and it's something hopefully we can look back on in, in a few years. What What have you found culturally with rugby? The similarities between the places you've been in, in Japan, is there differences that have kind of rocked you a wee bit or that you've enjoyed? Oh, I've really enjoyed this experience, you know, coming out here and, you know, part of me coming out was, you know, when I spoke to the club, it, you know, it's, it's about trying to, you know, help the, the younger players, you know, try and pass a lot of my knowledge on. So, you know, as well as still playing, I'm, you know, I'm doing a, you know, the start of some of my coaching stuff and, and helping some of the young Japanese players and, well, which is brilliant. You know, some of it's frustrating, um, you know, because, you know, obviously I'm quite competitive and stuff. But, uh, you know, again, it's it's just part of the journey. And, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, make the, the team and, and the Japanese boys as best they can be. And, you know, what, what I've certainly learned uh, from the, the, the work ethic, you know, is second to none, um, you know, in terms of, I think culturally, when they grow up, the, the way they're taught, it's very much, you know, they're, they're sort of, uh, talk down to, you know, as it were, they're told what to do and, and they do it very much to the letter of the law. So, you know, sometimes in a rugby context, that's probably not the best way. So they, they kind of have that trait in them. That if they get told to do X, they're going to do that to the best of their ability. And, you know, as in a game like rugby, you know, there's a lot of moving parts and you, you can't really do that. So, yeah, they're, they're quite rigid, I guess, in, in some of their thinking. So it's just trying to, I don't know, liberate them a little bit and, and then show them, you know, get their heads up, play rugby, that, and that can help them out. You're a smart cookie and you've you've mentioned about being at the end of your career and nearing retirement and all those things. So I've got no doubt that you've got an eye on, on what's coming. Is part of this coaching because you can see yourself doing that in future? Yeah, I mean, I'm just starting to turn the gears um, on that stuff. I'm actually uh, you know, running some of, the, some of the coaching stuff here uh, at my club, which, yeah, Bruce, I love the game. Um, you know, I always have from, from a young age and I'm really passionate about it. Um, again, it's it's a bit of a project. I mean, I've got a, a great little uh, young halfback here at the club, a uh, young guy called Ren Chan, um, who's an excellent little um, player, and he's really ambitious. He's got a great work ethic. Um, so hopefully, I can help push him uh, through into some international stuff in, in the next few years. So yeah, I really enjoy that side of the game, trying to make people better. Um, you know, through training, through watching videos, and. You know, it's well. It wouldn't be too bad a job. I don't reckon being 
you know, rugby coach certainly for me and him. It sounds like your uh, your little prodigy is a bit like a, a young Greg Laidlaw. <laughs> oh, potentially. I think he's got a fright over the last couple of weeks. I've been a bit grumpy with not having as much sleep maybe with a with a little man. So um yeah, don't tell Rachel, but you know, that's that's one good thing, campus where I can <laughs> catch up on a little bit more sleep. <laughs> When you when you're talking about being that guy to those younger players, who who was that for you? Who was that role model and sort of old heed for you? Um, well, I think I was pretty lucky because obviously I started uh, my career out at Edinburgh. And, um, obviously, uh, well, Mike Blair was was a big influence uh, for me because obviously he played the same position. But probably the one for me was was Chris Parson. Um, Mossy, uh, you know, as, as you and I all, all both know him, but just obviously at the time, you know, he was just extremely professional. Um, you know, took he, like, you know, he leaves sort of no stone unturned. That sort of character, you know, he'd be the last on the training field kicking, or whether it be his S and C work and all that stuff. And you know, he and he was just so well. He's very humble, isn't he? And and, and he was, and he certainly still is. And, you know, and I sort of thought at the time, you know, he, this guy's, you know, he's captain of Scotland, starts for Scotland, ended up with you know, over 100 caps, you know, and that's the way he behaves. So, you know, I was pretty lucky to have a few people like that uh, around him. Me. But obviously because of the goal kicking stuff as well, you know, he was probably somebody that I, I learned a huge amount of. You took up the tools when you left school, but was the ambition always, I want to be a rugby player? Yeah, it was. Um, you know, and I think started getting picked in, in age group stuff, and, and you know, obviously it gets a little bit more serious. And whether that's you know Scotland 18s, it's obviously not too serious at the time, or, but you probably don't realise it is. And then you get to that under 21 level as it was when it, when I played under 20s now, yeah, and you, you know, it becomes a bit more professional, and you and you get a small taste of you know being away, whether I've been involved in Six Nations or you know being away at World Cups, and you know one how much. <sighs> of a great challenge it is, but, you know, you can have good fun as well. I always played my, my best rugby when I was having fun and in a good environment. So, uh, you know, I think I was, when I, as soon as I got that first uh, few tasters of it, you know, I definitely realised I want to push myself to, to try and get uh, in a, a full setup. What barriers did you face? How, how often were you told you're too wee or you need to move club or you need to be here or you need to do this? So did, how did you cope with those things? Yeah, you know, I got told a lot of things, I and mean, I probably st- still get told a lot of things now. You know, yeah, you know, the big one with me was, you know, I was never fast enough, and and what I'll be about, you know, I almost, I'd, you know, you flip on its head, or, or certainly I did, you know, and I tried to be one of the, one of the smartest in my mind. Yeah, uh, you know, I tried to see pictures before other people could see it, and you know, I guess in many ways, along with you know my goal kicking and game management, that's. Essentially, how I, you know, how I forged my career, and there's, there's obviously, in my opinion, there's space in the game for for smart players, and uh, you know, everybody's looking for you know bigger, stronger, faster. But you know, I, I'm of the mind you want the smart ones as well, because you whether you take New Zealand for example, you know, there's not too many dumb rugby players, you know, in that setup, and you know, they're one of the best in the world. So, yeah, and that's yeah, that's a huge lesson for kids. You know, if you truly believe in um, in your own ability, if you, if you want to chase something hard enough, you, you can get there. Uh, but you have to believe in yourself. It's a massive one. When people are telling you, you know, you, well, you can't, you can't do it. You're not getting picked. Or you can either. There's two ways you can take it. You can listen, and you know, you can just accept it, or you can, or you can say, "No, nah, I'm going to prove you wrong," and get out there and do it. And that's for whatever reason. I've always had that kind of attitude since I was uh, since I was a bit younger, and it certainly stood me in great stead. You're a stubborn bugger, eh? Yeah, I am. I am. Don't know. Don't know where it came from, but uh, it's in there. I like to. I like to win, and uh, I like to be the best version of myself in many ways. So, b- being in a small town, like I, I know where you're from, and I, I know loads of the folk that you were rubbing shoulders with and kicking a ball with on the sideline, and you were a ball boy and doing all those things. Did that help? That the, you were in a, a wee place. There was always somebody to play with. There was always competition. You played it in other sports as well. Do, do you think that helped create the Greg Laidlaw that we've got now? Definitely, it helped. Um, 
I think, you know, where I grew up it is, in many ways, there was no airs and graces about it in terms of, you know, when you're coming through and, you know, people can see you, you've got a, a little bit of talent or whatever, that, you know, they always get, they get stuck into your training and, and whatever it is. And but in many ways, I think they, they want you to succeed as well. And they're, all, they're almost trying to help you in, in their own little way. And, but you certainly can't, your feet can't leave the ground. And, and that's probably one of the, the biggest things I learned is, you know, just because, you know, I've been, you know, been successful and, you know, half decent at chasing uh, rugby ball around the field, you know, you, yeah, there's no reason you could, you're above anybody else, you know, you're always on the same level and that humility thing has been a massive uh, thing for me over the years. So, yeah, and the competitive edge is, you know, it's, it's just what drives me and uh, pushes me forward. You've come out of a, a small town and then I think it was just before COVID, they had the 999 dinner. So, for your club at Jed Forest, you've got Roy Laidlaw, Gary Armstrong, and then Greg Laidlaw. That that's pretty special to be to be part of that wee group. No, I listen. It's 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 honestly one of the, one of the best things uh, for me to, to to have been a part of. Uh, to, to be quite honest, uh, Bruce, over the years, because you know, without the club or without Jed, without that sort of upbringing. You know, I would never know if if I'd be, you know, sitting here having this conversation for you, or I'd been able to, you know, play for Scotland as many times, and uh, you know, and certain people along the way within that club just really, really helped me. Yeah, at that at that young age, and and obviously Uncle Roy be, being my uncle, he's he was clearly a big part of my life, but but also so was Gary. He was he was a huge role model, uh, you know, for kids. And I always remember when he signed for, for Newcastle, he was he was obviously playing. For Jed at the time, and then it was a sort of talk of the town. It's you know Gary Armstrong signed professionally for Newcastle, and I always remember that, that sort of set something off in my head. It's like oh well, you know Gary's now playing professional rugby potentially. You know, in however many years this would be could be something uh, I done, and it was actually a, quite a funny story as well. And the type of person uh, Gary is as well. Obviously, um, we all sort of had a ten come along side us. Uh, John Rutherford came uh, next to Uncle Roy. Uh, uh, Finn uh, Russell obviously came uh, next to myself, and, uh, and Johnny Wilkinson came, came to the dinner. Uh, obviously, on, on behalf of Gary, and, and obviously Johnny Wilkinson uh, clearly is a legend, and he's a great man. And well, I think obviously when he gets invited to, to events, he's well. Sometimes he's probably on private planes or helicopters, and he actually got um, he got picked up in the back of a. Uh, uh, a Cook's van hire uh, van, I think it was from Newcastle Airport. I think Peter Peter Walton drove him up, and he he got he put his tuxedo on in the back of the van. Um, so that, obviously that kind of just shows you what kind of uh, person uh, Gary is as well. So yeah, some great characters, and uh, it was awesome just to, to give a little bit back to the club. I, I love it. I, I was gutted I couldn't be there. So you've got Roy with John Rudd, and that was obviously a. Um... A marriage made in heaven. I, I remember having a chat to Jim Rennick and he said because of the South District, it meant Roy and Rudd could play for those smaller clubs and it was the South that gave them the shop window for Scotland. And, and I loved that. I'd never thought of that. I did think it was funny that Gary chose Johnny Wilkinson. I think that was maybe for ticket sales rather than inviting chick jammers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was probably maybe Jed for us request that one as well. But... <laughs> Yeah, bump up the ticket, put, put another fiver on the ticket places, I think. <laughs> and then you invited Finn and you've already said you play your best when you're you're enjoying it and you're in the right environment. You and Finn just seem to just seem to click. How how did that come about? Because you you're not for the same place, you didn't play for the same club. What is it that happens when you come in a Scotland camp with somebody that's just a different beast from you, but it it seemed to work. Have you got? Can you put your finger on what the magic was? Um, I don't. I don't know if I can put my finger on it, but I always remember him coming in. Oh, actually, before that, I think we were, we were playing Edinburgh v Glasgow. I, I was at Edinburgh, and, and obviously Finn was at Glasgow. And we were through in uh, in Scotland. We were playing them through there, and um, out the back, the sort of back of the changes before you go out the tunnel on the field. There's a there's like a indoor running track, and there's a bit of a warm up area. And um, obviously, I, I think I was captain Edmund or whatever. Uh, I've come out, you know, having just a little stretch, and and I could see this guy further up the track, and he's got these headphones in, and he's like dancing about the place, and I'm sort of looking over, and I'm like, <laughs> and I see this, 
the lads start from Russell. And so I was like, the first sort of time I was like, this boy is obviously just come on the scene. He's, uh, you know, he's, he looks like he's sort of uh, confident. But and that, but that was that was probably one of the best things about him because he just he, he didn't change like when he came into the Scotland camp and he just had, he just really enjoys having fun, fun and, and being laid back. But behind the scenes, um, you know, he's one of the hardest workers in terms of doing his homework on whether that be defences. Um, and I remember his first test as well. We went out to Canada uh, not long, and I think Bernard did Bernard, Bernard just taken over actually sort of full time. And uh, we were playing Canada. We weren't actually playing too well, and we were sort of bumbling about a bit. And he just pulled this ridiculous chip kick out, like in around their twenty-two. And, and he just sort of—it never went too well, but he just sort of shrugged it off. And then he, he finished the game pretty strongly. And I, I just sort of knew from then that uh, you know, this kid had a bit of talent. And um, in many ways, he sort of—he well, he did. He, he sort of reinvigorated me a little bit as well. Uh, you know, because I was always pretty rigid and. You know, you've got to do the right thing, and and he sort of loosened me up a little bit, I, I guess as well. And I think we just had that that good balance. You know, I like to be quite serious sometimes. But he he was a bit more laid back, and we we just struck a really good balance, both on and off the field. You obviously helped him as well, though. It it wasn't a, it wasn't a just one way. You you were a good uh, sort of foil for him. Yeah, well, you know, I, I like to think so, and I think. In many ways, you know, hopefully, you, I guess you'd need to ask Finn, but yeah, I, I would like to think I was a bit of a common influence uh, for him as well because, you know, everybody feels pressure, um, you know, and some people show it in different ways or, or feel it in different ways. So, you know, and I, I very much felt it was my job, obviously, being a halfback inside him, but, you know, being that little bit older and having a little bit more experience at the time to, to really sort of help him out and, uh, you know, give him the best chance he could. And, um, you know, I think he really stepped stepped it forward, and you know, obviously he's playing for one of the biggest clubs in in Europe now, and you know, nothing nothing less than it than he deserves because he's you know he's, he's an incredible talent. How does it work? You spend a lot of time on the field, but you kind of train all the time. So you're in hotels, you're in airports, you're flying. How much time is it? Do you need to spend with the the nine and ten? How much time do you two need to? Just go for a wee private coffee, or is that not how it works? No, I, I, in terms of like the, the connections and stuff, I think they're massive. Uh, you almost you want to get to that point where you sort of you can look at each other, and, and you almost don't need to speak when you, when you're in the in the midst of it, and just that, almost that second nature. And, and both you know, on the field, you know, clearly that's the, the most important part. And you know, whether whether you've got slightly quicker ball, you kind of you need to have that. A bit of instinct in terms of yeah, I know Finn's going to flatten up here. This is where he, he likes the ball. He's, you know, more often than not, this is what he likes to do in this situation. And you know, so I can you know help him out a bit, or you know, try and put the ball in in places uh, you know that, that he wants it, and, and really sort of you know you know just give him every chance to to play well. And, but you know, and then that relationship off the field as well, it's it's an added bonus, uh, of course, because a lot of the time you you know become best mates with your teammates, but. Yeah, he's an added bonus, and, and certainly when he's a, a character uh, like Finn, he's, he's certainly hard not to like. <laughs> How much did you put in a goal kicking to make yourself? To me, that was one of those things you, and I could be wrong, but I think the, there was maybe a point where you thought, if I'm a really good goal kicker, that makes me even stronger and, and easier to pick if I'm kicking the way I, I can. Is that true? Yeah, that that'd be true. I think uh, obviously I, mis- mis- I mentioned Chris Patterson earlier on. You know, at, at the time, uh, um, obviously he was probably coming. You know, to the end of his, his career, he, he was obviously not nobody's getting any younger. And you know, I sort of realised um, at that moment in time, and probably in that Edinburgh team, there, there probably wasn't a, a straight replacement in terms of a goal kicker for him. And so, you know, I really sort of hammered that skill. You know, over the years, it's something I've really, I've took real sort of pride in, and try to, you know, make myself, you know, a sort of standout player in, in that, uh, you know, category. Um, so yeah, I spent a huge amount of time and, and huge amount of discipline, in, in many ways, uh, you know, to, to get myself up to to be one of well, at one point, one of the best kickers out there. And you know, that's that's all you're doing it for. All that repetition is, so when the pressure comes on, uh, you can hold your hold your technique and. 
uh, you know, hopefully they go over. There's a whole load of folk can kick a rugby ball and they can kick it through the post for the halfway line. But doing it in front of a packed stadium when it matters is a whole other thing. How much time and effort did you have to put into the bit that wasn't actually the kick, the the visualisation, the mental preparation, the calming yourself down? How much attention did you give to that? Yeah, I, I gave it a lot. Um, to be honest, Bruce, because I think it is such a huge part of it. Um, you know, as you as you mentioned, you, or even if you're a, you know a good kicker, you know, and it's funny because even if you kick well and the the team run or something, everybody's like, oh, awesome, you know, you're kicking well, and yeah, well, I am, but it doesn't count for anything. Doesn't give us you know three points tomorrow. It's 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 always quite funny. So it's I, I used to. When I was a bit younger and the, the body was still all good, I would I would always kick on a Wednesday. Uh, certainly when we played at home and in Murrayfield, I'd go in. Um, so on the day off, there'd be pretty much nobody else in the, inside the stadium, and and that was just you know my sort of time, you know, to sort of say to myself right on, you know, whenever the kickoff was it's Saturday afternoon, or you know I'm going to be in here. There's going to be all this happening round about me, but essentially it's it's the same skill. Uh, you know, so uh, and mental toughness is is uh, is a huge trait, uh, in my opinion, that the kickers, you know, have to have because you know it's such a natural thing. It's whether you're kicking a goal, first thing you think is don't miss. It's you know, like you know, if it, there's any golfers out there, you're on the tee, you know, you're like uh, you know, don't don't put it in the trees. It's it's essentially how how you can how you can keep that out of your head uh, in in the pressure moments. Hold your technique. It's one of the most important parts of it. Is there one kick in particular that you are very proud of? Uh, oh. no, there's there's no, one, there's one in my head at Murrayfield with a big celebration after uh, it that yeah, I wonder. That, that was a good one, but we, uh, yeah, that was a good one. That, that was a great memory. That, the one I had to kick that one. I, I kicked that one against Australia uh, down in Australia. Uh, which it was right in front of the post, but it was blowing an absolute uh, gale uh, and, and chucking down rain that night. So I was pleased to see that one uh, come off the boot uh, pretty nicely as well. And I, I kicked a good one for Edinburgh, um, you know, back in the day against uh, Ras and Metro when we had that yeah. crazy scoreline at Murrayfield. I might have kicked one from the well, the left edge uh, for me. And I think it just kissed the post in the way in. So. Uh, sometimes it's the ones you miss uh, you remember most as well uh, sadly Bruce and, uh, as is the, the nature of it so there's been a couple of them as well Are you able to put those to bed or are those the kind of things that every now and then your head hits the pillow and you're like oh, if only Yeah yeah, that, that, they're the ones you think of more than the ones that would go over uh, to be honest I remember missing a kick against New Zealand uh, I think it must have been 20 Get the years mixed up, but I think it could have been 2014 actually, as early as that. And we were playing pretty well, and I missed a fairly easy one that I just blocked out to the right. And yeah, that's one that certainly bugs me. I can't remember if we were in the lead already or we were pretty close. That kick might have took us into the lead, but um, yeah, they ended up scoring after it anyway, so it didn't make me look as bad. <laughs> I, I guess you're pretty hard on yourself, are you? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's something I've kind of learned to. To try and not do as much uh, over the years. Uh, I think, you know, again, it comes back to the family and uh, certainly Rachel, she's probably uh, seen, the, I guess, the, the worst of me in, in many ways. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of time you know, when you win games and stuff, it's easy, but it's, it's how you react and, and the defeats and stuff. And I've definitely mellowed over the years, but in the, the sort of younger years, you know, I'd, I'd be in a fairly foul mood of for a the whole weekend until I could get my sort of feet back on the training field and put it right. But I guess it's just part of the process you go through and, and everybody deals with it in different ways. Is it harder when you've had leadership roles to to manage that? Do you take on the weight of the world when you're captain? Uh, well, I probably did. Um, I always remember times when yeah, we maybe weren't going so well with, with Scotland or or whatever, you know, we're, we're struggling and maybe, you know, losing a few more games than we, than we should have. And, uh, you know, I'd probably remember some of the times thinking, you know, maybe maybe these some of these guys don't care as much as me and, you know, why am I putting myself through it? And, 
Yeah, well, I think when you're in that leadership position, I certainly took huge pride in the, the fact that, you know, I was captain and I wanted things to go well. And in many ways, I didn't like it, being captain, because of all the other stuff that sort of went with it. But it was a huge honour of mine. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, it's something I'll remember, you know, for the rest of my life. How does it feel that the bit I'm jealous of, and now camera phones and social media, I'm always surprised the number of cameras that can be in a changing room. But there, there was a heap of moments that were just yours and the team. There was there was nobody else there. You know, probably the coaches have left the room. What's it like in just before you go into the tunnel at a packed Murrayfield or, you know, an international stadium where, you know, you're probably up against it? What's it like in those last wee moments as Scotland captain, arms wrapped around everybody, ready to go? Have you planned your speech? Is it from the heart? Is there lots of sweary words in it? How did you approach it? Yeah, well, again, it's it's part of learning uh, the process, and you know, probably when I was I was a bit younger, you know, I'd be there'd be a lot more sort of passion to it, maybe you know, a couple of swear words and and what have you, but. I think you just got to read the group, you know, and that's, you know, that's something I sort of learned, and I definitely mellowed, you know, over the years, and, it, and it's just in the final moments, a lot of people can't take anything in. There's a whole heap of stuff happening. There's there's emotion. There's there's nerves. There's, ex, there's excitement. So I'd always try and keep my messages like real simple, you know, you know, focus on that that first part of the game, the, the anthems and stuff. They're obviously awesome, but they're emotional as well, and you know. Singing a national anthem, well, it, you know, it, it doesn't help you win games of rugby. So, you know, that that was essentially our job. So, a lot of the time, it was it was about trying to re- remove some of the emotion, and that that, that was a challenge for me because you know I was I was sort of I was emotional and I loved playing for Scotland. And, you know, I, I could I would love to do it again in a heartbeat. You know, but I'm but I'm too old. And and the best bit was, I guess, in, in many ways, is even before you get outside, is that that last part. You come out of the change room and, and you're in the tunnel. And you're ready to go, and you, and you, you know, obviously you're at the front of it with the, with the whole sort of team behind you. Uh, you know, you just can't replicate that that feeling of of the emotions you're trying to keep in check and and what have you. So yeah, just in, incredible experiences, uh, and as I said, ones uh, ones I'll never forget. Who was your leadership role models? Who did you look at and think he was a he was a captain? I would have gone in over the top with him. Yeah, well, I think the a lot of the boys that, that ironically, you know, never never done too much talking. Um, in terms of like a maybe like a, a four day Ross Ford, somebody like that, he, he didn't like to talk much, but you know, he he, he gave everyone, you know, when he sort of when he took the field, uh, and he's a, a real a, a close friend of mine as well, and and that's you know sometimes leadership is a you have to be able to follow as well, in my opinion. You know, being a leader, so sometimes it's it's about stepping back, um, you know, and because you've not got a lot. Of, I certainly don't have all the answers, you know, for all the areas of a game of rugby. So, I think you know, in the most powerful times, or the best time I had, the Scotland captain as well had a, a really sort of good bunch of people around about me as well. Fordy being one of them, uh, and just a strong leadership group, uh, you know, across the across the board. Who? helps you to become a leader so you're you're playing well you're you know you're coping with your own performance you're probably helping others but leadership something that you can learn and improve and you can pick from others and you can talk about was that ever a focus for you or were you just learning on the job well I was I guess in many ways learning on the job uh, you know when I was a bit younger um yeah, Andy Robinson was really good uh, when he was in Edinburgh. I was I was a younger player, and that sort of side of the game in terms of you know leadership groups and yeah, you know game drivers as they're called. You sort of nines, tens, fifteens, and um, you know that I sort of I was exposed to that in many ways when I was a little bit younger in terms of that side of things. And then we've been pretty fortunate over the years to, to be able to work with people who've. Have had military backgrounds, or you know, uh, hostage negotiators, or all sorts of people that I've met over the years. And uh, one guy I really liked was, was a guy called Eric Blondot, who's a French guy. 
uh, who Vern brought in. I, I think he worked with French Special Forces, and um, yeah, and I really enjoyed working with him. He sort of, you know, just brought a real a bit more clarity, I guess, to to, sort of to my leadership roles and and stuff like that. But I always remember he sat us down as a sort of leadership group and and really challenged us. And he was like, you know, can uh, can he sort of make uh, people like follow you essentially? And some of the guys said yes, but you know, I, I said, well, the answer is no because unless somebody's you know buying in, uh, you can. It's like the old ad, you know, you can take a horse to war, but you. You know, you can't make it a drink. So, um, you know, there's a lot of learning over the ways and sometimes people just don't want to be part of, of the process and uh, in many ways you've got to weed them out. So, yeah, I've learned a huge heap uh, over the years on, on the leadership front and, yeah, it's it's been something I've really tried to develop and, and understand. You and Vern got on really well, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Um, we did. Um, why did we get on well? Because... Vern just told people straight between the eyes how it was. Uh, and sometimes that wasn't pretty, even for me. Uh, and, you know, you sort of shudder in your, in, your, in your seat even thinking about it now. But uh, for me, it was the best way. And the, the, the group at the time, uh, you know, I, re- I know sort of really enjoyed that. Um, um, I caught up with, uh, with Joe Schmidt, actually, just here in, in Tokyo. They're, they're, they're of course with All Blacks at the moment. And, and he he obviously worked with Vern at Claremont as well, and he, he sort of said to me, uh, you know, the first one of the first conversations they had, Vern looked them straight in the eye and, and said, "I need to be able to trust you." Um, so that that was the kind of the, the guy uh, Vern was, and at the time, you know, Vern was, was awesome. He sort of totally reinvigorated me along with a couple of other things, and and really just really brought it home, I guess, in many ways. You know what it means to play for for Scotland. Um, which really annoys me actually because you know it sort of it, it took a sort of Kiwi to, to to be able to do that. But again, before that, we had a bit of a, a difficult run, and I guess we were a bit, a bit lost as a team. And um, yeah, so that, that was just great timing, and uh, he was somebody that I learned a huge amount of. How much of being a captain is managing up the way? Um, well, it's 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 part of it. See, you know, coaches a lot of the time they, they probably don't know half of the stuff that that's getting talked about <laughs> uh, within the group. So, you know, a lot of the time that that will fall on your head. It's like, you know, what we're doing this for, or why we're doing this, and the old the old morning in the change room, and and it's having that ability to to to, to I guess many ways challenge back the group and and say, ah, oh, right, okay, or, or I probably don't agree with that, but. You know, and then taking the th- the things that you think uh, once you've agreed on to, to the coaches and and getting your point across, um, it, it's important and it's a big part of it because uh, the players play the game. Uh, you know, Bruce. And sometimes you, I get really frustrated sometimes. You know, whether it be coaches or uh, yeah, well, mainly mainly some coaches in terms of you know they're always trying to. Yeah, interfere and train and stop training. And it, we have to figure it out, and you've got to let the players figure it out at, at some point, because essentially the coach can't do anything come the weekend. So, you know, and that's where they have to also have that relationship with you, with the players to put the trust in them. And, and once they put the trust in you, you know, that's where you can become on leaps and bounds. And, and I guess in many ways, looking back, you know, Vern put trust in in me and that sort of leadership group that I talked about before, and. You know, at the time, you know, that's how I felt we, we were starting to, you know, play some decent rugby. Did you ever have a wobble of your confidence? Oh, yeah. No, I wouldn't say all the time, but oh, of course, you know, whether it be you're, you're thinking, I can't maybe carry not too much form or you're, you've had a bad game. And oh, the, the self doubt is, it's in there somewhere, but you, that's. It, you just got to try and you know you got to block it out and in many ways you you, you can't have obviously you can't have arrogance but you, you've almost got to have self arrogance like within yourself to tell yourself and when you look at yourself in the mirror and say no nah, actually I can do this and you know I'm good at this this and this and you know I can I can do it, I can succeed so just get out of the, out there back yourself you know because at the end of the day nobody's going to do it for you and I think again that's that's something that's really drove me on and. You know, if I want to succeed, succeed, 
you know, I'm going to have to do this myself. So you just got to back yourself and have real, I think I t- touched on self-confidence before. It's such a huge part of it. Nobody else can really give you, they can tell you it. But if you're not telling yourself it, you're going to find it more difficult. When did the Lions come on your horizon? Were, was that something you wanted to deal with? Or are you going to give me the media answer that is, I just had to play well for Scotland to give myself a chance? Oh, I was desperate to play for the Lions. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, I was keen to go in 2013 as well, but they never picked me in either. So. Um, no, the Lions was, well, it was incredible. Um, I think I actually think Vern um, interviewed for the, for the job as well, and, and and I think he was uh, I think he'd interviewed pretty well by all accounts. So I think for me at the time it, it would have been awesome if if Vern had gotten the job as well. So obviously I was building a relationship with him, and um, but you know as it was, you know, it was a different coach, and and that's one thing that's that's also so fickle as well. It's you know coaches and stuff. It's it's essentially one man's opinion. Uh, you know, a lot of the time in terms of if, if they don't like you as a player, so if, you know, if there is, you know, any young players or people that uh, play the game, uh, you're listening, you know, don't be deterred because one person, uh, you know, th- thinks you're not good enough uh, because, you know, n- nobody's got all the answers and, you know, they might they might not know a huge amount about it. So, you know, back yourself and get out there and, and go and get after it. So how different an environment is that? I mean, you were... The, the story is always you've been knocking lumps at each other in the Six Nations for three years and then, right lads, you all need to pull on the same jersey. Was that difficult for you? I would imagine you had to have a bit of fire in your belly against your opponents and now they're on your team. Yeah, it, it was weird. I'm not going to lie. It, it is a bit strange, especially like early days when you, when you sort of first you know, get in the camp and you know, whatever you're doing, you, you know, you're getting measured up for your kit and you're, you're doing media days and I think because I was at Gloucester at the times so I'd travelled through with, with Ross Moriarty to, to London who had been selected as well and it's almost like you just look for safety you know stay, stay, with, stay with people you already know so find the, the two other Scottish boys that were on that tour and, and Hoggy and, and uh, Tommy Seymour um, and, and Ross Moriarty from Gloucester and basically stay with them all day <laughs> It's quite cagey. It's, uh, nobody wants to talk too much, but the people that have been on previous tours, they're all matey matey. So, yeah, just just a matter of sort of finding your feet and uh, just get in there and work hard. How much did you have to look after Hoggy? <laughs> uh, Hoggy was all right. Uh, Hoggy's, he, he did, he'd obviously done the tour in, in 2013. Uh, you know, so he was he was up and running with, with some of the boys, and uh, he's obviously a big character, Hoggy as well. And, um, yeah, so in many ways he was great for me in that environment. So, you know, I just sort of hung out with him, and uh, you know, he he sort of led me into uh, a few things and sort of helped me grow in the environment. I guess. Did you become a better player because of that experience? Uh, probably, yeah, yeah, d- definitely more rounded and probably gave me more confidence. I think in many ways as well. I think you realise, you know, certainly that added enemy. Scottish players are everybody as good as as the other players, and um, you know, and, and we've probably just struggled for for strength and depth o- over the years because of our our playing numbers, really. Uh, you know, and, and once we get a couple of injuries, it's always hard uh, for Scotland, and that's just the way it is, and probably the way it's always going to be. But um, I took a lot of confidence because you know you don't just play with the players; you, you train with them, you, you see some of the stuff they're looking at, and you know, video analysis. You, you work with other coaches. You know, from from Wales or you know whatever, or I think they were all pretty much all from Wales at the time. And as far as he was, he was I can't remember. He was with I think he was with England at the time. And, but you know, you just re- and you realise, you know, the coaches they're looking at the same things, uh, players are, are doing the same things, and we're not far off here. So yeah, you know, I definitely gained a lot of confidence off the back of it as well. So when you then come out of that and you go back into playing against them, were you? Were you sharper? Were you wiser? Were you, I've seen that, I can use that, I remember he does this, or was there too much going on? Well, well there was a lot going on, but you definitely, as long as you, you pay attention, there's, there's, there's sort of traits and, and players do and, and players like, and this is how they like to defend because of this. And so you can try, you know, you can try and certainly pick a few things up and, you know, and, and see if you can make a difference. But, and that's, you know, as long as you, you, you're willing to, 
you put yourself out there and, and, and try and learn and understand and, and not go in there and, and thinking, you know, just because you've been selected that, that you know all you can, you know, you definitely can pick up some some new things that, that can help you as, as a player and, and as a group uh, such as Scotland. Was there a moment when you were with the Lions of, I'm a British Lion, did you have a little moment with your red shirt? Did you, was it when your name was read out? Was it, was there a moment where you thought, hang on, I'm a, I'm a British Lion here? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite surreal. Um, but the travel out and stuff that we had at the time uh, to New Zealand, it was pretty messy because the seasons obviously drag on in, in, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And I think we only got to New Zealand two or three days before we, we actually played the first game. And uh, I think we only travelled up to where we were playing uh, the day before it. So it was a pretty, it was a bit of a rush. But it was sort of chucked together team. It probably everybody was sort of figuring each other out still. Um I always remember quite vividly it was after the warm up, we went back in uh, to the change room, um, you know, chuck your warm up t shirt off and, and whatever. And I, and I just remember sort of picking my head up uh, and just seeing that, that sort of red jersey on the peg in, in front of me. Um, and obviously, nowadays, we're pretty lucky you get your, your name and stuff embroidered on the jersey. Um, and that was kind of, it kind of just hit me then before the kickoff that, you know, that sort of realization you're going to pull, pull on a Lions jersey. You know, and be part of an incredibly uh, unique, uh, a unique team. So yeah, it was probably then uh, before I even played the game. And is it different from a Scotland tour, from a Scotland World Cup being on a Lions tour? Yeah, it is different. Yeah, I guess it, it's kind of hard to explain why why it's so different. But just to, I think maybe the pure numbers of fans, the, you know, the Lions ones. Uh, it was brilliant to see, but you know you, you certainly don't get too much downtime uh, or anything when you're out there. Especially New Zealand, obviously not the biggest country in the world either. Uh, the are toured in 2017, but yeah, it's real sort of real hectic, um, real busy. A lot, you know, a lot of moving parts. You know, playing a game, traveling, playing a game, traveling. So you're moving about, and you, you get that sort of feeling. Everybody's very much watching you pretty much every step of the way. So it was quite enclosed, but uh, definitely enjoyable. How do you, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How do you switch off and, and try and take that brain away and the heart away from rugby? Yeah, it's, well, through learning over the years, uh, yeah, to, to try my best, get away from it. Uh, you know, nowadays, I've obviously got the kids, uh, you know, which are brilliant. I've got, I've got three boys now. Uh, the youngest being uh, being eight weeks old, so uh, obviously spending time with the wife uh, Rachel as well, who, who I mentioned before has, has been incredible. Uh, I, love, I love to play golf uh, when I can, uh, Bruce. I kind of use golf. I quite like playing on my own uh, sometimes. Just uh, I thought I find it quite quite sort of liberating. It's uh, it's kind of my thinking time. Sometimes you just get the headphones in and, and away I go. Or sometimes you know no headphones and just try and clear the head and. You know, think about a bit, of, a bit of reset time. Where am I going? What am I doing? And, uh, you know, try and improve myself. So, over that length of time, club, uh, sort of pro game, international, Lions, you've obviously made some pretty good friendships along the way. Who who do you hold dear? Who's sort of the last WhatsApp message you sent? Who's the last phone call you had? Um... Uh, I stay in touch with a few boys uh, from over the years, uh, which is awesome. Um, I'm pretty lucky, I guess, in, in many ways to, to still you know speak to people within the game. Ross Ford would be somebody I stay in touch with. She's back in the borders. I spoke to both Hoggy and Finn uh, over over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I'd get the old message of Johnny Gray randomly, and uh, not so much keep up with Johnny, but he's he, he's he's somebody you could you know. You could see, and it'd be like you see them yesterday. Um, and a few guys from further, further afield, uh, Fritz Lee, uh, down in France and Clermont. I'd, I'd speak to Fritz a fair bit, and uh, and probably a few others that I've, I've probably forgotten about. But uh, you know, certainly some of the guys you've played against or played with, it's it's almost uh, it's, it's always brilliant to, to hear from them. And I'm, I'll try and stay up uh, with with some people, and anyway. I'll try and be a bit more proactive rather than just letting things slip by. If you look into your crystal ball, where's where's Greg in ten years' time? 
Well done, Tanya's team. Oh, oh, what age am I now? Um, well done, Tanya's team. I'll, I'll be involved in the game somewhere. I'll probably, I'd love to be head coach somewhere. Um, yeah, head coach of a team slash a country if I could. And, uh, obviously, there's a, a, a whole lot of war to go under the bridge before then, but yeah, I'd be ambitious to to, to be successful uh, in a role like that if I could be. And um, yeah, so we will see. I've got absolutely no doubt. Do you ever do you have much chat with your cousin with Clark doing doing in New Zealand? I do. I, I stay I stay up with Clark a fair bit, yeah, mainly on message and um, sometimes the, the, a FaceTime. Um, as well, so Clark's done incredible, uh, incredible things in terms of, you know, there's not too many coaches or, or people uh, that go, you know, from a, even from Scotland for, into a, you know, a rugby hotbed like New Zealand and, and climb the ladder like he's done. Uh, so he's obviously doing it uh, really well. Uh, I know he's really well uh, thought of down there. So yeah, and I think he, he's obviously seen a lot of things and worked with a lot of different coaches. So he's a He's a, he's a great sounding board, uh, you know, for, for me as well. Uh, your other cousin, Chris, is developing into a cracking coach as well. I wonder if we could get all the laid laws in one organisation. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. It might be, might be too many laid laws in the one place. We might all upset each other. But, uh, no, nah, Chris, yeah, Chris is doing well as well. I spoke to a few people back in Scotland that, that tell me he's doing pretty well. So uh, it's awesome to see we, we've been a, a family. Uh, that, that rugby's been a, a huge part of, uh, you know, whether, whether that was, you know, growing up, Chris and I are a bit, a bit more closer to age than, uh, than Clark and Scott. Scott being uh, the, the middle brother. Uh, uh, Scott's my boy. Yeah, but, <laughs> he was yeah, the he first was, back was, I ever knew that wore a scrum cap. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was a hardy bugger, though, Scott. And he but, was. Uh... I, I can't. I don't know. I don't even know if I remember him playing in the, the back. He was in the back row by the time. Yeah, I played with him, but he, yeah, he, he was a, he was a, a great player as well, and, and somebody that I love playing with for Jed. Uh, some boy, uh, you're some crew, Greg. I've absolutely loved it. It's uh, it's number one hundred, and I feel massively honoured. So thank you so much. And uh, I did tip you off on this, and I've got no idea where you're going. So at the end, I ask Greg for you. Happiness is winning for Scotland. <laughs> and you managed to do that a few times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that was what it was all about. They were the best times. Winning for Scotland is it's hard to replicate. What's the changing room like after you've won for Scotland? Oh, it's, well, it's obviously it's ecstatic. It's relieved. Uh, relief. I think that's a big one for me. Is, is the the relief? You know, just after after the game and all the pressure of the week, you, you win and, and that feeling of. Uh, you know, we've managed to get over the line, get, get the win, and uh, just get back in there. Boys are obviously on a, a bit of an emotional high. The, the staff are happy, uh, so it's a great place to be. You can have a beer with the, the boys. Of you know, put some blood, sweat, and tears in there alongside the staff. So yeah, it's it's great times when you when you when you're able to win. Did you like visiting the other changing rooms after games? Yeah, I didn't mind it. I didn't mind it. it was. Oh, it was always hard because you know if if you'd beat somebody, you know you you knew what it was like to be on the other end of it. But yeah, that's, that's a great thing about the game. I think you, you meet so many good people. If you, yeah, as soon as that final whistle blows or whatever, you get back inside and put your differences aside, and you know and go and see, you know, shake each other's hand and uh, you know and get on with it. And whether it's swapping jerseys or having a beer, it's yeah one of the great uh, one of the great traditions of the game. I think. Amen. Greg Laidlaw, thank you so much. Pleasure. Great to see you. Catch you soon. Cheers. What an absolute legend. If you enjoyed that, you can catch us on Apple, Acast and Spotify. You can watch on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, Greg Laidlaw definitely knows what an absolute star. And he, he wouldn't like it and he, he'll curse me for it, but he is properly a legend uh, and we absolutely love him. There are very few with a negative word to say about the man and that's because of the way he's handled himself over the years. Absolutely brilliant. And he's away to get a decent kip now away for the three burns uh, while he's on his uh, camp.
preparing, he reckons. I think he's just there for a sleep. If you enjoyed it, tell your friends, leave us a review, and hopefully I'll catch you soon. In the meantime, my name is Bruce Aitchison from the Happinesses podcast, and my happiness is egg-shaped. <laughs>